My dear young friend, said Mr. Micawber, I am older than you, a man of some experience in life, and of some experience, in short, in difficulties, generally speaking. At present, and until something turns up, which I am, I may say, hourly expecting, I have nothing to bestow but advice. Still, my advice is so far worth taking that, in short, that I have never taken it myself, and am the... Here Mr. Micawber, who had been beaming and smiling all over his head and face up to the present moment, checked himself and frowned. The miserable wretch you behold! My dear Micawber, urged his wife. I say, returned Mr. Micawber, quite forgetting himself and smiling again, the miserable wretch you behold. My advice is, never do tomorrow what you can do today. Procrastination is the thief of time. Collar him. My poor papa's maxim, Mrs. Micawber observed. My dear, said Mr. Micawber, your papa was very well in his way, and heaven forbid that I should disparage him. Take him for all in all, we ne'er shall, in short, make the acquaintance, probably, of anybody else possessing, at his time of life, the same legs for gaiters, and able to read the same description of print without spectacles. But he applied that maxim to our marriage, my dear, and that was so far prematurely entered into, in consequence that I have never recovered the expense. Mr. Micawber looked aside at Mrs. Micawber, and added, Not that I am sorry for it, quite the contrary, my love after which he was grave for a minute or so. "'My other piece of advice, Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, "'you know, annual income, twenty pounds, annual expenditure, nineteen pounds, nineteen and six, result, happiness. Annual income, twenty pounds, annual expenditure, twenty pounds, ought and six, result, misery. The blossom is blighted, the leaf is withered, the god of day goes down upon the dreary scene, and... And, in short, you are forever flawed, as I am. Dickens remembered his own family life as a boy, and his parents' marriage and their challenges inform many of his novels. He drew on the life experience of his father and of his mother. Mrs. Dickens, like Mrs. Micawber, tried to start a school for young ladies. I left at a great many doors, Charles remembered, a great many circulars, calling attention to the merits of the establishment. Yet nobody ever came to the school, nor do I recollect that anyone ever proposed to come. It was a failure, as so much else was. John Dickens was arrested for debt and had to move with his family into the Marshalsea debtors' prison. A suggestion was made to the stricken parents that their oldest son, who was eleven, should be employed in a blacking factory pasting labels onto bottles. They shamed him, as their present place of residence shamed him, by accepting this proposal without hesitation. It is wonderful to me, he wrote, how I could have been cast away at such an age. No advice, no counsel, no consolation. I might easily have become a little robber or a little vagabond. Again, this life experience informed Dickens' writing, and indeed ensured that he became not only an informed writer, but also merited the title of a social reformer. I can recall as a boy seeing Noel Langley's film of the Pickwick Papers, and being haunted by the miserable scenes in Marshalsea Debtor's Prison. When the breakfast was cleared away, the merry old gentleman and the two boys played at a very curious and uncommon game, which was performed in this way. The merry old gentleman, placing a snuff-box in one pocket of his trousers, a note-case in the other, and a watch in his waistcoat pocket, with a guard chain round his neck, and sticking a mock diamond pin in his shirt, buttoned his coat tight round him, and putting his spectacle case and handkerchief in his pockets, trotted up and down the room with a stick, in imitation of the manner in which old gentlemen walk about the streets any hour in the day. Sometimes he stopped at the fireplace and sometimes at the door, making believe that he was staring with all his might into shop windows. At such times he would look constantly round him, for fear of thieves, and would keep slapping all his pockets in turn to see that he hadn't lost anything, in such a very funny and natural manner that Oliver laughed till the tears ran down his face. All this time the two boys followed him closely about, getting out of his sight so nimbly every time he turned round, 
that it was impossible to follow their motions. At last the dodger trod upon his toes, or ran upon his boot accidentally, while Charlie Bates stumbled up against him behind, and in that one moment they took from him, with the most extraordinary rapidity, snuff-box, note-case, watch-guard, chain, shirt-pin, pocket, handkerchief, even the spectacle-case. If the old gentleman felt a hand in any one of his pockets, he cried out where it was, and then the game began all over again. In a documentary on Dickens' London, Cedric Dickens, the writer's great-grandson, brought Al Byrne to sum up the places associated with Dickens. Now, alas, Marshalsea Prison's been pulled down a long time ago. Now, that is the Marshalsea Prison in which my great-great-grandfather, John Dickens, Mr. Micawber, was imprisoned for debt. And then in those days, if you were sent to prison for debt and you declared on the poor debtor's side, which meant you would never be able to pay off your debt, you only got water and you had to rely on your friends to give you food. Later in that programme about Dickens' London and the traces of him still there, Alburn visits the Dickens House Museum at 48 Doughty Street, where Dickens lived for three years after he was married. Now, we're next door in Mary's bedroom. Now, you will remember that Mary came with the family. She was the next youngest Hogarth daughter, therefore uh, Catherine's next sister. She came, and she was about 16 when she got here. Um, she died, in fact, in this very room, in Charles Dickens's arms. Before I sort of talk about this, let me just read you um, Charles Dickens's letter after the event, um, when he had sort of calmed himself. They had to go away. He stopped writing Pickwick and everything else. I believe that Dickens's love of her was that she was young, she was tremendously enthusiastic about him and about his works and about everything he did. Here in this glass case is a pendant that Mary was wearing on the night she died. They had come back from the theatre, she was absolutely all right, and then she didn't feel well, she came up to her bedroom, and as I told you, she died in Charles Dickens's arm. He was very saddened by this event. It comes into his writings right the way up to Little Nell. Back to William Trevor and the giant at his shoulder. For the greater part of his life, stories that meant most of all to him. He described writing as the marvel of one imagination touching another to create something out of nothing and all through the medium of words. And he reckoned that Charles Dickens did it perfectly. And with every telling stroke, permanence is assured. Only the end of the world can send Mr. Micawber to his grave. As long as English is spoken, Oliver Twist will ask for more. His own reading as a schoolboy and such essay writing as he was expected to accomplish began awkwardly and without promise, he told us. The nuns in Yall, with difficulty, taught me to read. Miss Willoughby, in Skibbereen, with difficulty, completed what I'd begun. A single bookcase accompanied my peripatetic childhood, from Mitchellstown to Yall, to Skibbereen, to Tipperary, to Enniscorthy, to Port Leash, still Maribyrnong in those days. Its shelves, half empty at first, filled as the years went on with job lots picked up at country auctions. William Trevor then recalls that his father, who was a bank manager moving to various middle-sized towns in Munster, traded his sweet Afton cigarette coupons for an entire set of the works of Dickens. They were blue volumes, gold lettering on each blue spine, invitingly illustrated if you opened one. Occasionally I did so, I noted that the paper of the pages was very thin, and that their author, portrait etched above a flamboyant signature, was bearded and stern, a bit like I imagined God to be. But the young boy, William Trevor, did not rush in to read these books. On an empty summer afternoon, in the garden that stretched long and narrow behind our house in Tipperary, next to the gasworks. I have a great deal of difficulty in beginning to write my portion of these pages, for I know I am not clever. I was brought up from my earliest remembrance, like some of the princesses in the fairy stories, only I was not charming, by my godmother. At least I only knew her as such. 
She was a good, good woman. She went to church three times every Sunday and to morning prayers on Wednesdays and Fridays and to lectures whenever there were lectures and never missed. She was handsome and, if she had ever smiled, would have been, I used to think, like an angel. But she never smiled. She was always grave and strict. She was so very good herself, I thought, that the badness of other people made her frown all her life. I felt so different from her, even making every allowance for the differences between a child and a woman. I felt so poor, so trifling, and so far off, that I never could be unrestrained with her, no, could, could never even love her as I wished. It made me very sorry to consider how good she was and how unworthy of her I was. And I used to ardently to hope that I might have a better heart. But I never loved my godmother as I ought to have loved her and as I felt I must have loved her if I had been a better girl. Esther Summerson, the heroine of Bleak House, was a victim from birth, as surely as Fagin's ragamuffins were, as surely as Pip became Estella's, as Emily became Steerforth's. The innocent snagged in the treacheries of a wily world, the chance of circumstance that so often places the weak at the mercy of the strong. Dickens's own experience never let him down. Elsewhere in the archives, there's the Donegal O'Dooling documentary on Dickens' Irish connections, specifically his travels to Ireland. He loved public readings, and these were immensely popular. Dickens travelled to Ireland via Holyhead on the 23rd of August, 1858, arriving in Dublin in the early morning, and was delighted with his surroundings. He stayed at Morrison's Hotel, now demolished, which used to stand at the junction of Dawson Street and Nassau Street. A letter to his eldest daughter expresses well his pleasure. The man who drove our jaunting car yesterday hadn't a piece in his coat as big as a penny roll and had his hat on, apparently without brushing it, ever since he was grown up. But he was remarkably intelligent and agreeable, with something to say about everything. And contrary to his own rather gloomy predictions, Dublin was a great success. The Dublin girls, well... Every night since I have been in Ireland they have beguiled my dresser out of the bouquet from my coat. And yesterday morning, as I showered the leaves from my geranium in reading Little Dumby, they mounted the platform after I was gone and picked them all up as a keepsake. And how they must have shivered in delicious expectation as Dickens lowered his voice and launched into this. Master Copperfield, it's a topic that I wouldn't touch upon to any soul but you, even to you. If anyone else had been in my place during the last few years, by this time he would have had Mr. Wickfield. Oh, what a worthy man he is. Under his thumb. Under his thumb. Oh, dear, yes. There's no doubt of it. There would have been loss, disgrace, I don't know what all. Mr. Wickfield knows it. I am the humble instrument of humbly serving him. Ah, oh, how thankful I should be. Be humble, Uriah, says Father to me, and you'll get on. It was what was always being dinned into you and me at school. It what goes down best. Be humble, says father, and you'll do. <laughs> and really, it ain't done bad. When I was quite a young boy, I got to know what humbleness did, and I took to it. I ate humble pie with an appetite. I'm very humble at the present moment, Master Copperfield. But I've got a little power. The last night in Dublin was quite extraordinary. All the way from the hotel to the rotunda where he was to perform, Dickens' cab had to contend with a steady stream of people who had been turned away. When I got there, they had broken the glass in the boxes 
and were offering five pounds freely for a stall. You never saw such a scene. The Dublin newspapers were not slow to praise the performances, and Dickens, always sensitive to criticism, was not slow to respond. Generally, I am happy to report, the Emerald Press is in favour of my appearance, and likes my eyes. But Cork, strange to relate, was not quite so adulatory. But one gentleman comes out with a letter at Cork, where he says that, although only forty-six, I look like an old man. He is a rum customer, I think. For William Trevor, as a schoolboy, Dickens represented escapism from the quiet of provincial Ireland and introduced him vividly to other worlds, what he then listed as... To the wild entanglement of London streets, to the chill flatlands of Norfolk by the sea, to domestic Hertfordshire and marshy Kent, to the great drawing-rooms of the rich and important, to workhouses and taverns, to life that, for me, still throbbed almost a hundred years after he had recorded it. My small-town experience could neither contradict nor confirm the detail of his pages, nor did I wish to. You trust the fiction you love. I believed, without an effort, in Betsy Trotwood, in Mr. Murdstone, in Major Bagstock, in Mrs. Jellyby, in Mr. Jorkins, until I realised I wasn't meant to. I accepted that graveyards dead might still have a part to play, that ghosts would rise from beneath their tombstones if some quirk of the plot called them. I knew that Miss Havisham waited behind those high gates, merciless among her stop clocks, her companions the mice that roamed the table of our wedding feast. Trevor found that it was his own experience that the reader possessed forever the human images in a Dickens novel. The history of Rosa Dartle, written into her features. Joe Gargery with eyes of such very undecided blue that they seem somehow to have got mixed up with their own whites. His easy nature, mild temper, his goodness, a Hercules strength that wouldn't hurt a fly, are all there in that uncomplicated face. And Mrs. Joe's, with such a prevailing redness of skin that she might have washed herself with a nutmeg grinder, warns with every feature that any moment now she'll be again on the rampage. And Mr. Jaggers's, huge and gracious, all jowl and whisker and eyebrow, exudes the unforgiving power of the law. Mr. Pecksniff's oily wit morality keeps itself to itself. Raw-boned beneath its curlers, Mrs. Squeers tells more than her miserable charges can bear. Oh, drat the things, said the lady, opening the cupboard. I can't find the school spoon anywhere. Never mind, my dear, observed Squeers in a soothing manner. It's of no consequence. No consequence? Why, how you talk, retorted Mrs. Squeers sharply. Isn't it brimstone morning? Oh, <laughs> oh, I, I forgot, my dear, rejoined Squeers. Yes, yes, it certainly is. Uh, we, uh, we purify the boys' bloods now and then, Nickleby. Purify fiddlesticks end, said his lady. Don't you think, young man, that we go to the expense of flowers and brimstone and molasses just to purify them? Because if you think we carry on the business in that way, you'll find yourself mistaken, and so I tell you plainly. My dear, said Squeers, frowning. Mm. <laughs> oh, nonsense, rejoined Mrs Squeers. If the young man comes to be a teacher here, let him understand at once that we don't want any foolery about the boys. They have the brimstone and treacle, partly because if they hadn't something or other in the way of medicine, they'd always be ailing and giving a world of trouble, and partly because it spoils their appetites and comes cheaper than breakfast and dinner. So, it does them good and us good at the same time. And that's fair enough, I'm sure. And more from the Dickens archives next Sunday morning, including what William Trevor discovered about Dickens' writing and his craftsmanship when he began working on a television adaptation of The Old Curiosity Shop. But we begin with the concluding part of our feature to mark the 150th anniversary of the death of Charles Dickens, which occurred in 1870, when Dickens was 58. 
In our programme on the Stoll Writers Week some months ago, we included this comment by novelist Joseph O'Connor on Dickens. I think he's a very admirable man, very interesting person. His own childhood, of course, had been scarred by poverty. He spent some years as a young teenager in the debtor's prison in uh, Marshalsea, uh, trying to care for his family after his father had been imprisoned. He had a great love of the poor, um, but an ambiguous attitude towards the class system that a lot of the books try to engage in. As I say, I, I think he, Dickens always feels that the rich should be good to the poor, but he he wouldn't want the poor to be actually running things. Most writers, even if Dickens' writing style is very different to theirs, recognise Dickens as a master craftsman. We heard how appreciative the Irish short story writer William Trevor was in last week's programme. Also in that documentary, Giant at My Shoulder, he elaborates. In the mid-1970s, Trevor was commissioned by the BBC to adapt in 12 television episodes Dickens' The Old Curiosity Shop. He had not read the book for many years and remembered it as one of his least favourite of Dickens' novels. But the life and death of Little Nell is not all sentiment. There is a coarse-grained, rough-and-tumble, vigorous quality about the old curiosity shop in its grotesques and travelling people, in its harsh contrasts, its coincidences and contrivances, in the nightmare clamour that makes life intolerable for yet another Dickens' child and the monstrous quilp, splashing about in this most colourful of all Dickens' works, succeeds in the end in turning a chronicle of innocence betrayed into one of gothic horror. In working on the adaptation, William Trevor learned more about how Dickens worked, about the construction of his novels, and about how the fact that the original had been written in serial form and published in instalments did not allow for a general revision, as a writer could when considering the first draft of a completed novel. Adapting the old curiosity shop meant dismantling it in order to shape each television episode. In doing so, I discovered where, quite often, Dickens had run into trouble, and how he had, for the most part, found a way out of it. With novels written in serial form, as this one is, you can't change your mind after the event. Yet he somehow did managing with a stroke of genius to contradict the past so smoothly that the small repair was unnoticeable on the page. Only when he came to the final chapter did he admit insoluble difficulties, and since there seemed nothing left to do with her, little Nell was offered to the angels, while Barnaby Rudge clamoured for attention. Elsewhere in the archives, there are other programmes on Dickens, including an interview by Donal O'Flanagan with Dickens' great-grandson, Cedric Dickens, who had worked on a scholarly book researching the many alcoholic drinks described by Dickens in his various novels. Another one, you mentioned a, a, a thing which intrigued me called Dog's Nose. Dog's Nose. Yes, Dog's what Nose. Is that? Now, this is interesting because in the days of the old pubs, you could go in... And when they had the open fire, and you would find all the utensils for heating these up, things like Muller's, which was a dunce cap upside down with a handle, brass. And you would go as a patron of that particular pub and order yourself a quart, probably a, a pewter quart tankard of beer, and take it back to the fire where you'd find sugar and spices, and you would take your gin, because dog's nose is gin and porter. Mm -hmm. So I make that with my Guinness. And that's gin and porter, hot, with with some uh, spices on top. It's very hard to imagine what, what it tastes like. What does it taste it's peculiar? It's a very good warming drink on a cold night. Dickens had been a talented actor. Many thought he could have made his career on the stage. After he'd established himself as a prolific, popular and in-demand author, he persuaded himself that he needed a special drink to help him with this performing aspect of his career. But certainly in those days... When he was towards the end of his life and working very hard on these recitals, readings, um, he would have sherry beaten up with an egg, or an egg beaten up with sherry, or a little champagne to, to help him through the uh, ordeal of reading. And it was on another reading tour that Dickens came for the second time to Ireland in March 1867. He found unrest in Dublin, political unrest. 
This was scarcely surprising, as Dunnock O'Dooling emphasised in his programme on Dickens, since he had arrived just ten days after the Fenian Rising of 1867. This time he stayed at the Shelburne Hotel. On the day of his arrival, coinciding as usual with the performance, he wrote, rather painfully one imagines, to his sister-in-law. There is no doubt that great alarm prevails here. The hotel is constantly filling and emptying as families leave the country. I learn that all the drinking shops will be closed from tonight until Tuesday. Dickens, with the sharp observant eye of the writer, could not but be otherwise than apprehensive in his particular predicament, and the fact that St. Patrick's Day was near at hand did not greatly ease his mind. He spent much of his spare time in his room, compiling, as was often his habit, lists of names for characters and places in future works, as, for example, some of the following found among his diaries. Henry Ghost Sophia Doomsday, Alice Thornywork, Robert Gospel, Robin Scrubham. At any rate, Dickens seems to have been in somewhat better humour when writing to his daughter on the 16th of March. One would not suppose, walking about the streets, that any disturbance was impending, and yet there is that the materials of one lie smouldering up and down the city and all over the country. He concludes with typical wit. You may be quite sure that your venerable parent will take good care of himself. His last three letters from Ireland are packed with excitement and contain at least one accurate prediction. Dublin, the 17th of March, 1867. The most dangerous piece of intelligence imparted to me on authority is that the Dublin domestic men servants, as a class, are all Fenians. Belfast, Wednesday the 20th. I am perfectly convinced that the worst part of the Fenian business is to come yet. Belfast, Thursday, the 21st of March. In spite of public affairs and dismal weather, we are doing wonders in Ireland. That the Fenian conspiracy is a far larger and most important one than would seem from what it has yet done, there is no doubt. One regiment has been found to contain 500 Fenian soldiers, every man of whom was sworn in the barrack yard. How information is swiftly and secretly conveyed all over the country the government, with all its means and money, cannot discover. But every hour it is found that instructions, warnings and other messages are circulated from end to end of Ireland. It is a very serious business indeed. I have just time to send this off and to report myself quite well, except for a slight cold. As I've mentioned already, Dickens is often seen as a writer's writer. Fellow writers recognise his industry and his prolific output, and this before the age of the word processor, and indeed before the typewriter. As we heard from his great-grandson Cedric, Dickens had neither when writing all of his novels. All of which were written here, mostly with quill pens, as I told you. Try writing with a quill pen. We'll conclude our Dickens feature with two tributes from Irish writers, novelist Joseph O'Connor. If you're going to write big multi-charactered, multi-voiced historical novels, which my which last two books have been. Um, I, I, I think Dickens is the model, you know, and, and um, so, so I, I have more of an affection for him than I, than I used to. And short story writer William Trevor. This is how he concluded his documentary on Dickens in the Giant at My Shoulder series. I have probably reread him more consistently than I have any other novelist. Yet I still cannot identify the nature of his magic nor indeed do I wish to do so. I simply like the way he does it, is all I can come up with when pressed. But my affection may possibly also have to do with the order of his priorities. Politics and history play a part, but people and storytelling come first. No great writer is more aware of the strains of absurdity that run through human existence. None is as funny not to have been there when Mr. Tupman was shot, or when Mr. Pickwick stood accused of breach of promise, not ever to have met Mrs. Gamp, or Mr. Dick, or Bumble, or Jingle, or the gentleman in the small clothes, is indeed to be deprived. The people of Dickens are a multitude that would fill a cathedral. The tragic, the comic, the wise, the foolish, the hopeless, the hopeful, the good, the modest, the wicked, the dogged, the decent, the cruel. Knowing them has made my life 
just a little different. William Trevor concluding our features marking the 150th anniversary of the death of Charles Dickens, who died in June 1870. He was 58.